My name is uh, Tomasz Hayek and uh, I'm a psychiatrist, uh, professor of psychiatry at Dalhousie University in uh, Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, I work at the Mood Disorders Clinic and I'm a part of the bipolar uh, working group. I thought it was important for me to, to, to join this group for uh, many reasons, not only to just simply increase the sample size of the data sets that we have, uh, but also to allow us to use methods that would not really be a, that we can't really apply to just single site small studies. An example of such a method is uh, the, the machine learning uh, or uh, pattern recognition, which is a part of artificial intelligence. This uh, method has been making its way into, into psychiatry since about 1990s and uh, it's been widely used in, in many conditions, but the, the Machine learning, brain imaging research in bipolar disorders is at its relative infancy. Most of the studies have been quite small. Uh, the typical sample size is less than 50 bipolar uh, participants. And typically data are acquired and analyzed within a single site. So, so this, what I would call a first generation of studies, are not really uh, going to uh, provide an optimal performance for the classifier. These samples are not going to create a sufficiently uh, generalizable snapshot of the of the disorder and they won't allow us to apply some of the uh, more rigorous uh, cross-validation or external validation um, approaches which which are really needed to for this to work quite well so Enigma is ideally situated to to address these issues obviously it has access to large data from multiple sites there's no real uh, bounds on the heterogeneity so essentially we're getting a rather ecologically valid large uh, multi-site sample. So it's an ideal environment for application of the statistical uh, learning and an ideal litmus test where we can probably for the first time really test whether these, these methods would actually allow us to translate brain imaging from bench to the, to the bedside. Within essentially a year, we were able to get individual subject data from uh, over 3,000 participants recruited in 13 sites, 10 countries, 5 continents. It's really a qualitative game changer. So far what we've been mostly using in brain imaging analysis is looking at differences between the groups uh, in a mass univariate uh, way where the, the brain imaging changes are our dependent variable. The machine learning sort of turns this around and it is a truly multivariate uh, method of analysis uh, where the success is not measured in terms of the effect size, it's measured in terms of accuracy of how well we can classify a particular participant into having or not having the, the illness. So this is clinically highly relevant. The, the between group differences typically have small sample size, small effect sizes and are not applicable on an individual subject level. The machine learning uh, algorithms, which are multivariate, may get to the level of effect size which allows us to actually classify an individual person with, with sufficient uh, uh, accuracy. Um, but for that to, to really work, as I, as I mentioned before, we need, we need to separate the, the training of the classifier from its uh, testing. And there are various methods of, of doing this, but the methods that, that ensure that we're not double dipping, that we're not overfitting our models, are typically methods that require uh, that we completely separate the testing from training and ideally have an external validation data set. So this is really where a multi-site collaboration comes to, comes to play. When I started this, this work, I was a little bit skeptical. Uh, as a, as a clinician, I'm, I'm well aware of how heterogeneous these, these conditions really are. So I was a little skeptical that we will be able to find something that generalizes across the cohorts. And to my surprise, we actually did find something that, that generalizes across, across uh, patients recruited in, on five continents in 13 different sites. So that, that to me was, was quite surprising. We also wanted to peek under the lid a little bit and see whether it's similar features that contribute to classifications in different analyses. And again, I thought this is not going to be the case because of the, of the heterogeneity. But actually, it, there was an incredible overlap between the, the 
the features that contributed to classification in the best performing site and in the overall analysis. And also I was thinking that maybe if we get a significant classification, it will be mostly driven by a single high performing site. But that didn't seem to be the case. It seemed that, that the information that contributed to classification was actually spread across the, the sites. So those two things were also really surprising uh, to me and really made a point to me that this is a proof of concept that, that we are identifying something that's really generalizable across a really broad uh, snapshot of, of patients. In order to get the best uh, accuracy or the best performance out of the, out of the data, we needed to really aggregate the, the data across the sites. Uh, and when we did that, the, we achieved 65% uh, uh, accuracy, which was highly statistically significant, and there was a balanced sensitivity and sensitive specificity, each of about 65 as well. Now you may say, well, 65, that's not really striking accuracy, uh, and it falls short of the 80% uh, threshold that's considered to be clinically relevant. And I, I would agree with that, but, but we need to uh, consider several things in interpreting the finding. First of all, the, the illness is difficult to diagnose even using standard methods. So, for example, the interator reliability for diagnosis of bipolar 2 is as low as 0.40. So we don't really have a gold standard, we have more of a silver standard and there's going to be confusion, there's going to be imprecisions already in how we diagnose the, the patients. Number two, there's the, there's the heterogeneity. So there's subtypes that don't share their neurobiological changes and that's going to decrease the, the signal. And last but not least, we did not have access to raw data, we only had the engineered features. So we lost a lot of information in the process of, of uh, going from voxel level to about 160 uh, uh, regions defined by the, by the free surf. Our findings also provide evidence for the fact that if we really want to get most of these data, we need to be sh sharing the individual subject data, not just site level uh, results. So when we consider all these things, I think that the 65% the accuracy is actually uh, quite realistic and, and, and quite, quite uh, good to me. If the accuracy was much higher, if we were getting to 90 or 95, I would be very skeptical. I, I would not believe those results. We would also like to, to maybe look at some um, unsupervised machine learning techniques where we would be looking at clustering or trying to find factors within the patient samples. We know that uh, bipolar disorders are uh, a heterogeneous group of, of conditions, so there may be unique subtypes defined by the biology and uh, the unsupervised machine learning might allow us to, uh, to find some of these subtypes. Uh, we would also like to see, to, to model the effects of heterogeneity on, on the brain imaging data because that's, that's a, uh, an issue that, that cuts across all psychiatric uh, conditions, uh, we are dealing with heterogeneity. We may not be cutting nature at its seams. We may be lumping things that biologically differ. And uh, we need to find better ways how to, how to uh, deal with, with this problem. The barrier to entry for Enigma is, is very low. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, anybody can, can uh, join. So even centers who, which would not have detailed phenotyping beyond uh, patient control dis di uh, distinction uh, can, can join and their data uh, could, be, could be used. Uh, and we were working with, uh, with uh, structural brain imaging data, so something that a lot of centers would have. And I think it's, it's uh, really important to uh, reuse these, these data that it's in the best interest of the society and, and the, the, the funding agencies and the patients to really make the best use of these data, such as in these, in these collaborations.